Good morning. My name is um, Andrew Futter, um, Professor of International Politics here at Leicester, and I've been given the honour of welcoming you all to this excellent event. And again, thank you very much for joining us on, on a Saturday. It's not uh, the usual academics uh, thing to work on a Saturday, as I'm sure you all know, but I think it's well worth giving up a bit of the weekend uh, for what we have today. Um, first things to say is a huge thank you to Andrew Gibson, who I think has now disappeared behind a, a, a rather nice uh, picture um, for all his hard work um, in, in organising this event today and for reaching out to us at Leicester to co-host. Uh, and of course, thank you to all the hard work from Student Young Pugwash UK uh, in general. Uh, I know this is the latest in a, in a long list of very good and very informative uh, and very useful events that they've run. Uh, and also a massive thank you to Ludovica Castelli, who I think you can see on your screen there, um, who has led things on the Leicester side and worked assiduously to make sure this happened uh, today. We had hoped, of course, that this was going to be uh, an in-person event, uh, but for obvious reasons, around about a month or so ago, we took the decision to hold the conference online. And I know most of you will now be familiar with this, but hopefully we are moving towards a world where we can get back to in-person events. And while this means that we don't get the chance to welcome you to our fine city of Leicester, um, it has meant that we could open the event to a much broader range of participants across the UK um, and, and indeed beyond. And, and as you'll have seen from the agenda, we've got a fantastic lineup of presenters. And my understanding is we have over 100 people signed up uh, to the event today that will that'll be, that'll be involved. Um, I'm particularly excited about our opportunity to host this conference today because it addresses themes that are very close to my own heart, um, but also to some of the research that's being done here at the moment at Leicester. Um, you may well may be aware and uh, a disclaimer to say thank you very much to my colleague Alameda Samuel who put together the background that you can see behind me but I'm, I'm lucky to be leading a team uh, of excellent researchers on the third nuclear age project here at Leicester which directly deals with many issues of technology and peace uh, that we're going to be talking about today. The third nuclear age team are looking in particular at how technological innovation and change alongside what appears to be the emergence of a multipolar system of great power nuclear competition are fundamentally transforming our nuclear world. And at the heart of this project is a desire to challenge and re-examine re many of the ideas and frameworks that continue to govern um, our, our global nuclear order, um, but also to make sure that we're having the right debates with the best possible understanding as we move into what may well be a more dangerous era in our nuclear story. And I think as a result, it's fantastic to see that the themes and topics that are being addressed today by such a, a great range of speakers, many of whom uh, it gives me great pleasure to say that I know well, and, and it's brilliant to, to welcome them back. Um, I think it's particularly exciting to see so many next generation and early career scholars and professionals participating today. We have survived over three quarters of a century without further nuclear use, at least in part down to luck. And you and organizations like Pugwash are the key to managing our nuclear future and ensuring uh, the continuation of some sort of nuclear peace. Um, and with that in mind, I want to wish you all an enjoyable and productive day. And I'll hand over to our first panel chair, Dr. David Elwood from Pugwash. Thank you very much. Hi there, thank you very much. Um, well, it's my pleasure to uh, represent British Pugwash here. I've been a committee member for uh, a couple of years now. And it's one of the great joys to partake in something which is outside of our normal career um, and volunteer and step up and try to um, help as a team to uh, further um, secure peace in the world, which I always think is um, we're very much focused on what are the new emerging threats in the world. But with every threat comes, um, with every new technology also comes a new opportunity. And so um, I, I sincerely really hope that we can focus on uh, have two minds to the, all these emerging threats that we have to be conscious of but at the same time look for opportunities to build new alliances and new connections which make our world more stable and more peaceful in the future with that being said it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker it's dr alexei drew um, who is uh, from uh, a senior rand analyst at uh, rand eu and, um, and uh, I hope uh, I can hand over to you now, Alexei. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, Andrew. It's great, as you say, to see so many familiar faces, even if it is on a screen once more rather than in person, I'm sure we'll get the opportunity to um, renew our, our friendship and collaboration in a more physical sense, hopefully sometime within the none too distant future. It's been far too long, but it is a pleasure to be here even digitally nonetheless. Um, it's a fantastic organization. I've had the, the opportunity to work 
alongside a couple of times in the past and it's great to be able to keep going with that today i as one of the foot well, the first speaker of the conference is always a difficult kind of role to fill so what i kind of wanted to do rather than delve too deeply into the the particular area of, of research that is, is close um, to my heart and my um, day to day i kind of wanted to to flesh out the scope a little bit more and then delve into a couple of areas i think are interesting so this is a panel around emerging technologies and um i have taken to in every time i get asked to be on one of these these panels on this topic to start by questioning the very concept of what emerging technology is. Um, I did my PhD in cybersecurity. Um, I finished it four years ago, and I've since been to a vast array of panels that are on emerging technology. And yet when I started my PhD in 2011, it was not emerging then. It's certainly not emerging now. It has fully emerged. The technology is there. We use it on a day-to-day -day basis to allow us to do a vast array of social tasks, economic benefit, um, political opportunities, and obviously increasingly military ones as well, and defense and security components. Now, that's not just the case with cyber or any other M-Tech or emerging tech, if you want to use the Americanism of M-Tech. And I recently ran into people from MIT who are confused at our use of the full word, which confused me somewhat. But what I want to suggest here is that a lot of the technologies that we are grouping within the, the nuclear defense and disarmament context as emerging technologies are only emerging technologies within the context of defense. And even then, I would say are emergent. Some of them are further ahead on that path than others. And it's, they're fitting into the, the defense, security, international geopolitical context that is emergent, not the technology themselves. What's What's telling is the way that we frame these technologies as emerging, because that really reflects the, the dearth and lack of information and understanding that exists within the political context for how these technologies operate, what they mean, and indeed how far they have emerged and have reached a point of a relative maturity. If you want to look at those that are, I would argue, further back down that path, if you were to look at actual AI, for example, rather than machine learning, but the concept of a general artificial intelligence, well, we're definitely not there yet, um, despite the fact what some people in policy might seem to think or suggest they believe by the policy decisions and the furor around that partic particular set of concepts. Quantum, again, there are a lot of promising developments within the space of quantum research and quantum science and how it might interplay into cryptography, space um, communications and deep space exploration as well. But again, we're still at the very early stages of researching what that is. There are, however, very clear applications of technologies that first made it into the, this bucket, cyber and algorithms or machine learning that we are seeing very mature uses of in the defense space. I'm going to come back to those um, shortly on in this kind of talk. The other bit I want to point out is that the level of where that these technologies are placed upon this track of emergence is incredibly asymmetric depending on the actor that we're referring to and considering at the time. For states such as the United States, um, Russia, China, India and others that are rapidly developing capacities in these emerging technologies, they are much further ahead on this track than others. There's a significant asymmetry between the, the developed nations and developing nations in terms of what they can do with these technologies. But what that means is we need to consider where the power sits with regards to when we're considering norms, standards, behavior, policy, and doctrine with how these technologies are used. We can't afford to allow the concerns of those who are the haves to overrule those who are the have-nots at this point. One, because at some point they will likely develop those technologies and therefore have to work within whatever standards of normative bodies, legal or otherwise, we've created. And two, because it would simply be irreflective of the future that I hope we'd like to transform with these technologies. So that asymmetry has implications for what we do going forwards. There are a few other things I'd like to, to point out is that although the technology itself um, in some cases is well emerged, uh, is mature, is used in defense and industry and society and, and economies, what isn't is our placement of these in terms of doctrine. 
that again is a relatively asymmetric point. Some states have a very well developed set of doctrine to include how to use cyber in conflict scenarios, where they would use it, where they wouldn't use it, to what extent, what targets are acceptable and what aren't. Other states, on the other hand, either are far less transparent with what their doctrine in fact is, or simply do not yet have one of their own. That is rapidly changing. We've seen an increasing um, publishment, publication of doctrine from, for example, the French on their AI policy, which is really quite helpful and very instructive. But there is a, still a massive gap between those who have decided to both develop clear doctrine and to publish clear doctrine, and those who potentially have developed doctrine and not released it, and have decided to go with an ambiguous um, outward position as to how they will or won't use some of these emerging technologies. And the other type of those who both have no doctrine and potentially have no interest in signaling what that doctrine might actually be and therefore the implications. Now, the implications of these are essentially, I would argue, an increasing risk of um, unintended escalation. Um, an example of this might be the inclusion of cyber, if you take that as a case study. So when I was doing my doctorate, um, cyber warfare was the, the um, key thing. In fact, I've seen with the, what's going on with the Ukraine at the moment, a, a continuing or a resurgence of the rhetoric around cyber Pearl Harbors, uh, third world war through cyber, cyber first strike, and these kinds of assertions and, and commonalities tied between older forms of conflict and a cyber version of. In reality, what we've seen in the last decade is that cyber predominantly within state to state interaction can generally operates below the threshold. It operates as a form of predominantly espionage as opposed to outright conflict-based actions. It's about sabotage, data collection, um, ingress and, and theft, perhaps, of I, in, um, intellectual IP or intellectual property. But it's not about making things explode, achieving military effect. Most of the time, there are exceptions. Uh, and Ukraine is a very good case study of that. However, the problem with it is, is that those states that are predominantly using this cyber espionage approach, well, Espionage is something which generally is opaque by design. States will not signal what capacity they have. They won't signal what capabilities they have or are developing. And they certainly won't signal to other states the lines that are there in terms of when a response will be forthcoming or when it won't. What does that do for international stability and security? It makes it much harder within pre-existing um, areas of conflict or those that are um, beginning to coalesce for actors to realize where the off ramps might be. There's a lack of understanding of what are the implications of varying forms of action, which means that essentially this opacity, the, the strategic ambiguity of where cyber sits within the escalation pathways of states such as the US, the UK and others, means that what we have is a risk of unintended consequences. And a perception that often exists that cyber is a lesser um, form of offensive capability than a physical one. That is based on a lot of assumptions and context that might not necessarily fit the bill when it actually plays out. And this lack of understanding, lack of clarity, I think is a significant risk coming from a well-emerged technology, one which certainly potentially doesn't deserve to still fit in this bucket. Um, there are other things that I think fit into this same concept and this the, the asymmetry um, that exists in terms of doctrine, capability, as well as um, the kind of grey zone conflicts that we're seeing predominantly now. And that I think is something that's going to be touched on by another presenter in information operations or influence operations. There's a lot of usage of uh, a technology which has become synonymous with how we operate and how we interact as social beings through digital means that is has been utilized by state interest to gain advantage either domestically or internationally. What isn't often considered is what is the long-term implications to what is a conjoined information ecosystem. The undermining of trust in information as the public perceive it um, and the undermining of our ability to communicate in a manner that is to be believed on any platform including social media or in traditional means of diplomatic interaction 
is a risk synonymous, I would say, with um, the same one I mentioned with cyber. An example of this would be, uh, I would suggest, the current crisis you see in Ethiopia. Um, the government there, in the middle of a, essentially a civil war, has been engaging in the use of social media platforms to essentially drive um, support among not just domestic audiences, but also the international diaspora. But and so doing has essentially pre-primed the pump of distrust for in within a conflict which is already de get degenerating significantly along ethnic lines. And that is something that will have much longer term consequences and likely not simply be constrained to Ethiopia alone. And these sorts of risks are the kind that we're not really considering. We're looking at short term goals and gains and failing to consider what are the long term implications of our inputs and usage of these emerging technologies when existing dynamics of escalation and conflict. And that lack of forethought, again, I think is contributing to a longer term direction of potential miscalculation that could escalate to a much larger scale. Now, the last thing I want to, to kind of cover um, is kind of coming back on, on David's point that we want to have some positivity. There are opportunities in technologies that it's not all doom and gloom. And I always try to end things on a more positive note. And, and in this case, I think there are certainly positives. The opportunities for machine learning to provide um, more transparency through um, data applications on large amounts of data, for example, early warnings and detection is significant. And I think that is an opportunity, an example of one that gives us a ray of hope to suggest it's not all um, gloom on the horizon, that not all of these emerging or emerged technologies are completely things to be thrown out and discounted as too risky. There are opportunities to be had. I would argue, however, what we need to do is be aware of the balance. We need to properly weigh up the costs and benefits of not just the technologies, but how we decide our doctrine and how we decide on our levels of ambiguity to transparency. In an international system where increasingly states are falling back towards great power politics, trust is, is critical. Many of these technologies and the way they've been used have fundamentally undermined trust, not just between states, but between states and those that um, the governed and the governing, but and also between communities within those states themselves. This kind of direction is one that we should be not just aware of, but actively working towards um, retracting or restraining as much as possible, but also making use of the opportunities that are presented by things that may not be as emerging as they may seem, but are in fact um, well on their way to being full-fledged members of the international concepts of security and democracy. Um, and I'm going to leave it there and pass it on to the next speaker and look forward to the questions from the floor. Okay, um, we thought that we'd have uh, two sessions and then uh, a longer pause for questions. So, um, so and that way we'll have uh, um, we'll collect the questions together in the chat boxes. So um, let me introduce Orlando Gill, and um, uh, Orlando's going to talk to us about information warfare and the Asia Pacific. Um, and uh, uh, can I just hand over directly to you, Orlando? Yes, of course. Um... Uh, sorry, doorbell <laughs> Um, Okay, I will just set up. So I have a presentation. I'm going to ask the question everyone asks. Can you see that? <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> okay, um, yes. So today I'm going to be talking about a topic that is very inter interesting to me. Um, and it's based more on a kind of investiga investigatory explorative piece. And it's basically about cyber operations which intend to have a psychological impact um, in the Asia Pacific conducted by China. So what is meant by cyber operations with psychological impact? Isn't that a little bit vague? And the answer is, yes, that is vague, but I think there is reason for this kind of classification. 
So the way I've defined it is as network operations, which aim at the cognitive level. And these operations manipulate information between or on the network to produce changes in perception or behavior favorable to the actor. So this is an expansive definition, which includes information operations, yes, but also disruptive, atta disruptive attacks against the network, which seek to produce some kind of behavioral change. Um, so this is situated within strategic thinking, and I think it's very, very important to understand strategic thinking because that also informs how you're going to actually analyze how things occur in actuality. So there are many different thoughts which come into these sort of operations, but the ones that I have plucked out is Weishi and informationized warfare. So Weishi is the closest understanding we have to deterrence, but it basically is um, deterrence and compellence as one. So I would compel you to do something and that would be trying to deter you. Basically kind of coercion to deter is the literal understanding of Weishi. Informationized warfare is also another really important um, concept and it's a bit tricky to define, but it's not specific. It's not a specific kind of warfare, but it's the application of information technologies to all kinds of warfare. So in this instance, psychological warfare is obviously most pertinent to the kind of discussion I'm talking about. And psychological warfare is the means of influencing individuals with a strategic goal that supports political and military objectives. And informationized warfare, when kind of talking about psychological warfare as well, would just be the application of information technologies to psychological warfare. In other words, if this is not too tricky to follow, psychological warfare is informationized warfare, would be the understanding. So this is situated in an even broader context, which I think is very, very important to understand. Um, there's this really nice uh, quote from the Science of Military Strategy, which is the PLA text, People Liberations Army, so the, the Chinese military, um, which is to look towards the sea to observe the world with a cold-eyed attitude. So in other words, to look at the world very objectively, to see the patterns that are naturally, organically developing. Um, and this basically compels cyber to... I don't want to say be developing, but being used in a certain way, or at least being thought to be used in a certain way. So one of these global paradigms is informationized conditions. Informationized conditions is a description for the environment we find ourselves in. Essentially that information systems and technology are vital in the victory um, and peacetime struggle for political power. Um, and then secondly is war, war and peace distinction. So China basically sees the blurring of war and peace um, since the end of the Cold War, uh, which, I, which I also think is quite a normal way of thinking for many other people as well. Um, but this means that kinetic has less utility in the sense of, uh, and I'm not saying it doesn't have any, but more directly in terms of there's kind of protracted or prolonged periods of peacetime. And if you want to be vying for um, extend political power, then a good way of doing that is through cyber. And so cyber in that way should actually very well not be undermined. And we're looking towards the kind of sharper ends of uh, soft power, so you can say. But again, don't undermine just because it's called soft power. Um, and at the core, China cares really about political security. So this is otherwise known as party security. So even though they're operating overseas, ultimately they still do very much care about the domestic, and that's really important to keep in mind. And lastly, Cyber operations are strategically useful in the sense that it helps China still keep an image of being a responsible global citizen. I know that a little bit um, other people might have like different responses to it, but that is still an important image for China themselves to at, least, to at least be able to legitimize to other countries. That's kind of a good way of thinking about that. So I'm not going to go into each because there's far too many, but I just do want to say that there's quite a few different examples in the Asia Pacific. Um, now, I want to highlight from these kind of overview of example cases that there are different kinds of actors involved um, and hacktivists in particular are very, very interesting. So they actually can have particularly close relationships with the government. And this is not new. So this was, um, you know, emerged in the late 1990s, for instance. So that whole kind of China is, you know, blurring well, peace and war, blurring civilian and military. It's, it's not actually particularly new, but I also think that's quite a truism for many sort of historical things anyway. So I wanted to actually go into three particular cases to really consolidate or to actually demonstrate what these kind of theories really mean in practice, but also to see what sort of patterns do arise. So the three I had picked was of Taiwan, the 2016 to 18 information campaigns. And these are primarily against, if we're looking towards information campaigns, 
looking at the kind of targeting political processes, then this, these were primarily against the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP, who care about um, re retaining that uh, status quo of an independent Taiwan and then information operations, which is called the Kuomintang Party, um, who obviously care about you know, having closer ties with China. And the South Korea case is from 2017 about trying to deter, or I should say implement Weishi with a terminal high altitude defense system, which China perceived as undermining their nuclear deterrent. And lastly, a Hong Kong doxing website, which were very prevalent amongst 2019 to 20, and these were against anti-government protesters. So how do they fit into the cyber and cognitive model that I had outlined earlier? Well, ultimately the target is, as I perceive it, cognitive. So with Taiwan, you have information campaigns, um, you see a wider network of actors um, and spread of information, dissemination, and this attempt to produce more long-term behavioral changes if we're at least looking at, again, those kinds of information operations. With South Korea, you see um, causing South Korea into not deploying THAAD and attacking the network, trying to produce what I perceive as short-term behavioral changes. And with Hong Kong, you see the use of networks to proliferate information and instill fear, which can be a mix of long-term and short-term. So I'm not going to go into each, but there are interesting patterns that emerge from um, cross comparison. So obviously the first is Taiwan or with the kind of actors involved. So since the goal is dissemination, they've employed um, different kinds of actors. So for instance, prior to the 2016 ele elections, netizens had posted to Facebook um, um, towards of then Tsai Ing-wen candidate who is from the DPP and also president um, criticizing her. And then you also had marketing firms conducting information campaigns on behalf of the CCP, which also criticizing the current admin. And then you had content farmers employing individuals overseas. And these individuals were, for example, freelancers from Malaysia. So you really have a full host um, of individuals working towards this. Hong Kong similarly had kind of similar case of different actors being involved. So the doxing site, for instance, um, Hong Kong Mob, that's one of the doxing websites, was very well coordinated. So they had a financial structure basically built in. And this financial structure meant that if you gave um, the site certain information about people like social media handle, name, address, and misdeed as well, I don't know how the misdeed is determined, then you would receive money. Um, and this was um, advertised as well in foreign currency like yen as well, Japanese currency. But you also saw government coordination here. So the official Weibo account, which is a microblogging platform um, of China's state-owned TV network published a video of another doxing website called Hong Kong Leaks. Um, this had encouraged people to contribute to the fight against the anti-government pro protesters. And you also had the same post shared by Weibo accounts of local Chinese police, media outlets, and branches of the Chinese Communist League. So Hong Kong and Taiwan show that what composes state security is these range of actors. South Korea stood out in comparison in that it had these uh, short-term impact. And so it used disruptive techniques, which to me seems to fit that kind of aim, and it, which is called software sabotage, according to, again, PLA text. And this was, this had a whole host of things like increasing cyber uh, intrusions by 2,400 in the first half of 2017 from 4,600 in 2016. And you also had internet protocol addresses that took parts of um, South Korea's conglomerate Lotte down. And this is Lotte who had basically agreed for its golf course to be used for deployment. However, what they all have in common is that cyber is ultimately understood as a combined strategy. So, you know, Taiwan, for instance, you have PLA aircraft flying into Taiwan's defense zones. South Korea, you had economic coercive levers at the same time as this other kind of cyber operations were going on, um, which had ultimately shaped 0.4% of South Korea's GDP. So economic levers actually had quite, maybe perhaps even more of a significant um, impact. And with Hong Kong, you obviously have physical violence amongst the civilian police force and the national security law, which was implemented uh, as of 2020. Another commonality is that impact is very difficult to measure. So this is obviously, you know, partly due to combined strategy. It's very difficult to isolate cyber and say that this impact was because of these operations. That's quite tricky. And second is that long term is very difficult to measure. Um, it's obviously difficult to measure, um, you know, whether a country has been morally, um, their, their moral has been degraded, for instance. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how you would measure that at least, or you'd have to conduct it over a very, very long period of time. Um, but there are indications of impact. 
So this is something that is important to say. It's not like there is no impact. So for instance, with the information operations in Taiwan, there was a suicide of Taiwanese diplomat Su Chi Chang after the circulation of fake news that he had left Taiwanese tourists um, stranded at Kansai International Airport during the Typhoon Jebi. And then you also had the election of Han Kuo Yu of um, the Kuomintang Party, who, which is partially linked to the kind of surge of information operations that had supported him. So overall, deterrence and compellence seems to be blurred, um, at least the case of South Korea. Um, civilians act as part of ensuring state security, which is, I think, a very, very interesting thing. And it's a whole another topic of its own about the state and hacker relationship in China. Um, measuring the impact of cyber coercion is definitely harder, given that it's combined. Um, coercion may be present in less, um, less non-disruptive means of influence. So I think it was talking about with Hong Kong, potentially can be argued as coercive, even though you're not necessarily using, um, you're not attacking networks, for instance. And cyber alliance definitely with China's ability to justify claims of being peaceful while influencing domestic affairs of another state. And so these different operations that may traditionally be separated, all fundamentally, in my eyes, use the network and information to elicit some kind of psychological reaction and behavior. So lastly, recommendations. What do we do? This is the trickiest part. Um, so obviously, I'm not going to come out with recommendations for each specific government because there are too many governments in the world and it's all very specific to the political processes. But there, I think there are some general things which I can at least suggest. Um, so the first is, I would say specifically machine learning, leveraging machine learning with prudence. Um, so what I mean by that is malicious actors, I mean, first of all, machine learning can be used very beneficially. So uh, malicious actors operate in a specific fashion. There's a kind of pattern to them. Um, such as you know, operating on a large scale on social media platforms. And using this kind of pattern may be better than content filtering. Although content filtering is important, but as, said, as I said, it should exercise with prudence because there are in-betweens between disinformation and you know, accurate information. There is information that may be very, very exaggerated, for instance, but that is technically somewhat true. So there are quite difficulties in actually trying to determine what exactly falls into disinformation and on top of that you need to ensure that you actually have uh, the trust of people so you don't keep spotting out um, news that is actually not disinformation for instance because that will lower the trust. Um, secondly is to have critical thinking development this is obviously very um, very important um, and it's connected to media literacy and it's something that humans do exceptionally well in comparison to what you could say um, machine learning really at this point. Um, so this would look at, this would be things like expansion of training resources for civilians and civil society participation here is important. So this would be like think tanks providing training methodologies and frameworks which teachers can then use. Um, it's very important for individuals to be actually able to somewhat differentiate about the authenticity of news. Um, especially if your country that's bombarded by quite a lot of different kinds of um, information that may be false. Um, in terms of strength in numbers, so this is kind of more talking about the operations that are a bit more um, disruptive against networks, I guess you could say. Um, this is obviously quite tricky and does rely on other recommendations like resilience, for instance, domestic resilience. Um, but there is definitely a strength in numbers. So allies holding countries accountable is very, very important. And that ability for China, is, you know, China basically cares about being able to appear as a responsible global citizen and to be able to justify actions. And at least by having more countries and numbers, then you can set up an expectation for what is right and wrong. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that a country is going to naturally maybe abide by this, but it is a good way of trying to at least build towards some kind of understanding what of what acceptable and unacceptable behavior is, which I think transparency is very, very important when it comes to um, comes, comes to cyber, um, or at least cyber diplomacy. Um, and lastly, is to not isolate cyber. So this is just a kind of finishing note, but I think it's it's um, quite obvious, which is that you know cyber isn't just a cyber issue. Um, as I had outlined earlier, it's part of a combined strategy. Um, there are multiple things also. Um, alongside cyber operations. And so 
you know, when you're trying to respond to these kinds of things, it's also important to um, involve such things like diplomatic responses as well. So um, that's everything I have. I hope this was interesting and not too boring. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alanda. Um, so we thought we'd pause briefly now before going to our third speaker and, um, and have some questions. And maybe I can start by posing a question um, to both uh, Alexei and Orlando. Um, so um, this, in terms of quantitative analysis, it's um, very much, it's a much bigger problem to try to capture some quantitative analysis on, on cyber issues. Um, and I'm not simply talking about this from a mathematical point of view, but from the point of view of breaking things down into very simple terms that can be communicated to the general public and to policymakers. So um, if you think um, in terms of casualties, if you think in terms of GDP, um, you know, these are very simple measures that um, the general public and policymakers can grasp. And so I wondered if uh, either of you would like to comment about what sort of measures can you put on this vast array of cyber threats, um, how can you quantify them um, in such a way that you can communicate salient features to policymakers and the general public? I would, I would love to come in and try and answer that one. Uh, difficult questions are my favorite, particularly on a Saturday morning. Um, in, in terms of quantifying, it is, it is really important. And I think that numbers is one way to try and take a very complex set of issues and their dynamics and concepts and their interplays and translate it to a wider audience. Um, cyber, you're right to say, because of the, the wide array of how, what fits within the cyber bucket, as I think Orlando has really well like demonstrated right there, it's not um, as simple as computer to computer and that's it. it. It can be quite hard, though there are some examples that I, I would generally go to depending on what audience I'm trying to talk about. And um, a good one, for example, if we're, if we're talking financial damage, GDP loss or impact, I would talk about the impacts of NotPetya on the Maersk shipping company. Um, for example, this was a, an attack that was targeted specifically at a Ukrainian um, financial institution that due to the nature of many cyber attacks um, effectively um, washed over far further than its intended target um, of the offensive act and infected um, a large number of the, the systems and um, capabilities and capacity of the, the company to the point that they had to spend a huge amount of money effectively replacing a large amount of actual physical hardware. So there are examples where you can give a definitive financial impact of the kinds of risks that we're talking about. It's very hard and it's the, you mentioned, for example, number of casualties. That's a difficult one to always quantify because cyber to, to a point um, when, when the, the, the field of cyber terrorism as an area of academic study was young, um, a common argument, and this was when Neil Jenkins's concept of cyber um, terrorists want a lot of people watching and a lot of people dead had come out of, I think it was another RAND study, ironically. What we actually had there as the problem is, well, where are the, where are the actual physical casualties from cyber attack? And to date, there are still very few instances that you can point to. Every now and again, we get an example of um, an attempt to tie a cyber attack to a, a human death. There was an instance, for example, in a German hospital um, as a result of ransomware not too long ago, where there was an attempt to suggest that this attack that had crippled access to um, data resources and um, a couple of pieces of machinery in a German hospital led to the death of a patient. The eventual inquest, I believe, actually concluded that wasn't the case, that it was more complex than that. And another example might be again in the Ukraine where cyber attack, I think it was called black, um, Dark Ice or Black Ice, um, I lose track, was designed to take offline Ukrainian power generation. And this was obviously in the middle of winter. It only happened for a short period of time, but Ukrainian winters can be pretty harsh. And it wouldn't be hard to imagine in that scenario that there were likely, if not physical casualties, significant human harm caused by that. So there are a growing number of instances that can be attached to and used as examples of the risks and implication in a quantifiable manner. But I think what we come back to again is that particularly when we stray into information operations, 
the impacts very much sit within the psychological damage, the influence and the more esoteric forms of harm to the human that are even more difficult to quantify. But we can contextualize them in a manner that policymakers across different departments of interest and the general public, more importantly, I would argue, can grasp the importance of their understanding and their input into what these their actions and policies actually are formed on it. And that's that's my take. I don't know if Orlando had anything she'd like to add. Um I'll just add a little bit. Um yeah no I I, I completely agree about the, the psychological psychological comment as well and about kind of having to gather more indications it seems to me. I think one of you know the key issue it seems to me is establishing causality and so even before quantification um even before quantifying things there are big issues in my eyes when it comes to actual qualifications of qualifying things um so for instance um off, off the top of my head attribution is, is very much a key issue but if you can't attribute to a certain actor then how are you then going to actually um you know use quantitative data to connect to a certain actor, for instance. So for instance, coercion, cyber coercion with China, I've seen very, very little literature um, written about it. The reason being because no one can fully establish if it's China. Um, so there was an um, incident in Mumbai with a power outage that according to Recorded Future, which is a private service security um, company consultancy, they had a report which stated indications that it could be connected to China, but there's no actual, this is a definite claim. And so I think that can, in some ways, um, close off some possibilities of trying to explain things clearly, and then being able to actually use more kind of quantitative data in that case. A lot of things I think rely, I mean, I don't know if I can accurately say this, but rely, it seems to me, rely much more on indications and somewhat kind of a correlation, um, rather than a specific this is actually true because A caused B. And I'd like to come back on the attribution point because it is, it is kind of important. And I think that there is a, there's a further layer of complexity here. So forensic analysis of um, offensive cyber capability has significantly improved in the last 10 years to the point that I would suggest that most complex and um, offensive uses of cyber that you see make the news there is like it's highly likely, um, particularly if they target the US or members of Five Eyes and that kind of treaty group, that there is knowledge of where it came from. The problem we find in terms of connecting those dots to the, the quantifiable component is that attribution of cyber attacks has become more politically restrained than it is technologically restrained. Attribution is something which is done behind very well closed doors. And the information sharing about that is very restricted, even between allies, to the point that it's very difficult in many cases to see a concerted allied effort to attribute, because it's a political thing more than it is a technical thing now. The, the limitations on attribution of offensive cyber use, I would argue, are now more political than they are technical. But that does lead into the same point that Alanda is raising, that it's then very hard for the academic community to actually pull out quantifiable trends and data because the data is simply isn't made available to us because of the nature of what that would mean for, if you like, cyber diplomacy and the use of that capability between states, particularly as it's espionage, not conflict, so below the threshold. Hi there, I'm, I'm having a little problem with my connection and I hope you can hear me. I'll try turning off my video. Um, thank you um, for those answers. Um, we have a question from Niels Renson. Um, I'll read the question out. For you. I have a question for Dr. Drew. How do you expect the asymmetries you mentioned with respect to access to technologies and doctrine to develop in the long run? Are there specific technologies which you expect to undergo a process of democratization among states, e.g. similar to UAVs and ransomware? Others, which you expect to remain in the hands of a few powerful actors similar to nuclear weapons? Yeah, uh, that, is, that is a really good question. So 
democratization or knowledge transfer is, a, is another topic that's really key to my heart. Obviously, democratization with, with cyber has almost two meanings, depending whether we're talking arms control or the concept of can the access to technology create um, conditions for democracy. But in this case, we're talking the former. I would suggest that it's highly likely that the more um, the more code based to, to use a, a very um, kind of blunt instrument forms of technology will will essentially transfer and spread and proliferate to use the, the correct terminology the the boundaries and the the tools that we have both legislatively and um, practically to constrain the spread of what is effectively zeros and ones in varying different forms of coding language around the world are incredibly limited the other there was a number of reasons why i, I think that we're, it's it's almost inevitable that we see um, things such as offensive cyber capability of varying levels of advancement um, the varying algorithmic and machine learning um, capabilities proliferating um, include the simple fact that this is a very attractive set of technologies um, it's cheap it's a very quick way to gain significant advantage within your um, geopolitical area or region and on the global scale in terms of balances of power so it's attractive for one the barriers to entry are relatively low it's essentially you need the skill set the human capital that can understand the technology and the the resources or capability that you're in many cases simply purchasing not necessarily developing um, the fact that it's very easy to physically transfer these technologies in a manner that is potentially very easy to circumvent whatever controls legislative or normative that are in place um, much easier to transport a um, usb pen or a file transfer than it is to transfer um, a piece of gps equipment for a helicopter or a satellite um, and the final bit i would say is that a lot of these technologies are fundamentally dual use and i, I I say fundamentally for a reason. Uh, I think historically it was much easier to categorize technologies into of military use or of civilian use, and the bucket that was of both was much smaller and easier to identify. Now, pretty much every, particularly in, in the machine learning space, almost every form of algorithm you could develop or machine learning pattern or system you can develop could have a militarized use. Um, a great example would be more well, pattern recognition in general. Uh, great for medical use, fantastic. An example would be DeepMind's use of um, pattern recognition to identify um, protein folding. It's fantastic, revolutionizing our medicine for decades to come. But pattern recognition could also be used in militarized robotics and artificial intelligence systems to allow for improved identification of targets. So it's fundamentally dual use. So yes, I do think many of these will spread. To the final part of the question, will some remain or take longer to do? I, I would say longer. I don't think it's, it's this is a, a matter of will it or won't it. it. All of them will eventually. Some might take longer, and those are based upon the more physical resources required to develop them. And this would be things like actually advanced robotics, um, quantum, again, for example, because it requires um, materials and the development of actual laboratories and physical capabilities that are much harder to transfer or develop internally. So, yeah, I, I think in short answer, we will see these technologies proliferate and that asymmetry um, changing over time and probably a much shorter time period than we've seen with nuclear or any of the other previous iterations of this form of militarized technology. Okay, thank you very much. Um... I think we'd like to move on now and to our last speaker for this morning's session um, is Anna Nadi Baze, and uh, she's a PhD fellow at the Center for War Studies at the University of Southern Denmark. And Anna would like to talk to us this morning about, about the global debate on lethal autonomous weapons. Okay, let me hand over to you, Anna. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll try to to share my slides. Okay, I think it's working, yes? Yes, perfect, thank you very much. Okay, yes, I'm a PhD fellow, as David said, at the University of Southern Denmark um, and, a, and a researcher uh, for the Autonomous Project, which um, 
uh, examines how uh, the development of weaponized artificial intelligence uh, affects international norms on, on warfare and the use of force. And I closely monitor the global debate uh, on autonomous weapons, which is the, the topic of my presentation today. And starting off with definitions, um, very important. So uh, there is no universal definition of an autonomous weapon system. Um, every government have, has their own working definition. So, for instance, the UK has a much more a precise understanding uh, than the US, for instance. And uh, I tend to, to rely on the definitions uh, uh, of put forward by the late uh, UN rapporteur on human rights, Christoph Heinz, or the the ICRC, uh, which are basically uh, systems that select and apply force to targets without human intervention. So they have an autonomous choice uh, on selecting a target and using force against it. And um, as been, it has been mentioned before, this is a panel on emerging technologies, uh, but as Alexi also uh, mentioned, um, uh, and I, I tend to agree with with um, with the not using this term because automation and autonomy have been part of weapon systems for decades. Um, but uh, it is with you know rapid uh, developments in the sphere of artificial artificial intelligence and its uh, applications and its subsets, so machine learning. Uh, computer vision, machine vision, and uh, also developments in robotics, that uh, we see a gradual movement on the spectrum of autonomy in weapon systems so towards um, fully autonomous weapons that take these critical decisions uh, on the basis of algorithms. And you might have also heard, of course, the, the term lethal autonomous weapons or killer robots. So. Um, this uh, focuses more on the lethality of autonomous weapons and uh, so their ability to kill. And it's a slightly problematic um, depiction. It makes the debate uh, more future oriented and very much shaped by the dominant narratives of AI in popular culture. So we have this depiction of Terminator-like machines that uh, acquire their own intelligence and decide to revolt against humanity. So it gives us an impression this is something from the future. Um, we don't need to worry about right now because uh, we are um, not close at all to, to having a, um, a, a, a artificial intelligence that is uh, similar to human intelligence. But um, as it's also been pointed out by several experts, so Professor Stuart Russell in a recent BBC uh, lectures series that um, we shouldn't necessarily consider this a science fiction. And it's actually important to, to look at the current trends and practices in weaponizing AI and robotics. And um, this is one of the major objectives of the Autonomous Project is to look at what is going on right now and how this affects um, norms of warfare. So for example, my colleagues have carried out a study of um, uh, air defense systems with autonomous and automated features in critical targeting um, functions. And uh, they have found that um, those features have contributed to an emerging norm of diminishing human uh, supervision and human involvement in, um, in using force. So, even if uh, formally human operators uh, retain the final decisions on targeting, uh, in practice, um, the decision is often meaningless because um, there's, um, there's been a decrease of the situational awareness and, and uh, just of the operator's uh, actual functional understanding of how, algorithm, of how algorithms make decisions. Um, so, in the absence of international legal norms and regulations on weaponized artificial intelligence, it's, um, it becomes uh, important to study these practices because these developments raise a number of concerns. So um, these include legal concerns and whether um, this would actually comply with international law, uh, ethical concerns, of course, you know, what does it mean uh, for humanity if an algorithm uh, 
uh, or yeah, a machine or a robot uh, as uses force and kills uh, a person. Uh, and uh, security uh, concerns, you know, there are debates on um, what is the mean for the proliferation of, of such systems and whether they contribute to, to a certain AI arms race. So as I said, currently there is an absence of, of legal norms. So is it possible, um, is there a potential for legal norms? And this is where we come uh, to the debate uh, on autonomous weapons at the UN. It's been mostly ongoing within the framework of the uh, convention on certain conventional weapons, uh, which bans or restricts uh, the use of specific types of weapons. Uh, so there are uh, five protocols uh, that ban weapons. So for example, binding lasers and some experts and NGOs uh, hope that autonomous weapons would also be banned in a similar way uh, under this convention. And uh, in 2016, the, the states parties uh, created a group of governmental experts on laws, uh, which um, is basically has been meeting a couple of times uh, per year in Geneva to discuss the, the, the issue. So it has a discuss, discussion mandate um, and um, just yeah, debating um, uh, any really. Uh, what the topic of uh, laws. And uh, so far, they've been able to, to agree by consensus on 11 guiding principles in 2019. Uh, this has no legal standing, but uh, it was a step forward. Um, but since then, there's no, not been any, any kind of other agreement by consensus. And we are, we are also far from anything that resembles a ban on, on these weapon systems. Uh, and it's been quite a difficult debate uh, due to a number of things. So as I said at the beginning, there's no universal definition of autonomous weapons and uh, different states uh, have different understandings of technology in general, of human machine interaction, and of course, different interests um, and strategies as well. So we have a, a group of states, um, some of which are major developers of these technologies. So uh, the UK, um, the US, uh, Israel, and, uh, and Russia, for instance, uh, argued that the current international law that we have is sufficient to regulate the use of um, autonomous weapons. And then we have a, a group of about 30 or 40 states, uh, depending on the estimates, which argued that um, we need a new a uh, legally binding uh, agreement on a, a ban, essentially, or a regulation. And um, uh, all this, they are also supported by the Red Cross, Human Rights Watch, and several organizations uh, around the world. Um, and so last December, the convention had a review conference and renewed the mandate of the GGE. Um, again, it, it basically, so it's now to consider proposals and elaborate by consensus possible measures. So basically uh, continuing the discussion. And this fell short of many of the expectations of especially of activists. Um, so here we have a few reactions from civil society that uh, there's inability to make meaningful progress, a wholly inadequate response. And some states also said, this fell short of their expectations. So it was, uh, in other words, a complete failure uh, in their view. So what's going to happen? Um, this year, the GG is set to meet for 10 days, so uh, in March and July. And um, there is, uh, in my observation, no indication that the previous impasses will be, will be resolved uh, and, um, then we, we've heard, especially in the recent weeks following the December meeting, um, suggestions of changing forms. So taking the, taking the discussion elsewhere. So some have suggested to take a majority vote at the UN General Assembly. Um, others point to the option of just uh, leaving the UN framework uh, in general and going into an independent process to get to a, to a ban. So they, 
um, they look at the examples of the Mine Ban Treaty and Cluster Munitions Convention, um, which are examples of treaties that have happened outside the UN framework. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so there are pros and cons to, to going into, a, into another framework for, for the, for, to continue the debate. So on the one hand, of course, um, some say that the major developers of autonomous weapons just wouldn't sign to the treaty and just, uh, yeah, it has happened before, right, in arms control negotiations. So um, they, yeah, they, they wouldn't participate in the, in the debate. Um, and so then that, was, that would even exacerbate the divisions that we have already. Now, on the other hand, uh, a treaty, a legally binding treaty, um, that would uh, go outside of the of the um, CCW framework uh, would have the potential to cover other context, context of use of autonomous weapons. So, um, outside of the armed conflict context. So um, we've seen that we know that yeah, there's potential for other ways of using these systems. So. If we think of counter-terrorist operations or domestic law enforcement or um, an authoritarian government, for instance, using it against uh, its own population. Um, just these days on the news, we say, we've seen the US te testing some robot dogs to patrol um, the border with Mexico. So um, there is potential for other uses that would be as dangerous as um, and uh, as the ones um, in armed conflict and, and a legally binding treaty could cover these these other um, uh, uses as well. And uh, that would be a normative benefit. And another one would be um, to that it would actually uh, limit the proliferation of autonomous weapons um, because the, the states that would uh, potentially sign to sign on to a, to a legally binding treaty um, would probably have less military capabilities, but they could still use um, these technologies. So if they sign on to, to a ban, then it would at least limit the proliferation, uh, which would also be uh, arguably a great benefit for international law and human rights. So, uh, I'm uh, fortunately not a fortune teller, and uh, it's really hard to predict uh, what's going to happen with this debate. In my opinion, um, with, the develop with the technological developments and all the concerns that they raised, um, there is a need for some kind of legally binding uh, document or commitment to re retaining human control over, uh, over the use of force. Uh, but um, if the discussion continues to go around in circles this year and we continue to have no legal norms, then uh, it becomes uh, important to study the practices of uh, related to weaponized AI and robotics around the world. And um, this is what we aim to do. So I invite you all to, to uh, um, learn more about our research and thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you, Anna. Um, so um, I'm looking for questions uh, for Anna, and maybe I'll start by, I'm not sure if this is a question, but it's a, it's a kind of comment. Um, from the Pugwash background, we're always thinking about um, nuclear risks. And uh, a very interesting contrast here is how um, we went through a phase change with the introduction of nuclear weapons. So we went from being um, a nuclear free world to suddenly being a world where we could understand in a sense the full impact weapons would have upon the future of warfare. Um, now, um, instead, as you pointed out, we have this gradual transition from um, non-autonomous non weapons into fully autonomous weapons that we're undergoing. And uh, so we have this much greater opportunity for policy debate and exercising uh, rationality in how these weapons are, uh, are constrained or introduced to the world. So um, I think it's a real challenge um, for all of society to take up this dialogue, to um, 
um, for every individual to get involved because it's something that we have the time to debate, whereas with nuclear weapons, we didn't. Um, so um, those are my thoughts about, about this. Um, do we have any specific questions for Anna? I have a question. Um, I guess, oh, sorry, or Alexi. Um, but I just wanted to ask, uh, yeah, I think it's really I'm fascinating. Not sure if anybody can hear me. Oh, okay, I'll just ask the question. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is a really fascinating topic and that I've looked at, obviously not as in much depth as you have. Um, you're by far more the expert than me with this. Um, it just seems so complicated to me in terms of actually like what to do about it because it ultimately seems to me um, like, well, you, I guess you guys are trying to limit something that isn't yet fully um, there yet, if that makes sense. So even though there are like trends, for instance, to imply that, well, yes, you can construct such a thing. It's very difficult to actually have states to have a good understanding of what that might even be and I'm, I'm just curious you know what do you think is actually kind of um i guess you could say blocking a ban for instance um and what do you think about sort of present day solutions so things that you can do for do for right now because i'm of the more kind of side of I'm not sure how effective things like preemptive bans, for instance, would be because it just seems so terribly difficult for every state to agree to a definition, and because there's so much, um, so many, you know, politically useful things that you could get, for instance, from a, a lethal autonomous weapon system, as you would define it, um, that it just seems to me like there's so many roadblocks. So, have you ever thought about things that maybe other kind of actors should be doing as well? So, for instance, like industry actors. Um, and you'll also that other question of what you think the kind of primary blocks um, seem to be. Thank you. I hope that's a okay question. No, that's that's perfect. That's uh, also the questions I ask myself every day. Um, in terms of yeah, the the preemptive ban is is essentially what a lot of the NGOs are looking for. So the campaign to stop killer robots and and others, and um, some experts have criticized this uh, this approach, yeah, saying that that's very unlikely, and that this whole like morality part of oh, it's immoral for robot, it just doesn't work. It's not uh, not convincing enough for states to agree. Um, so, yeah. I think one uh, one possible way uh, or possible agreement would be some sort of political declaration on uh, um, like reaffirming uh, commitment to human control over, uh, in the use of force. So, and in different situations, but not not necessarily in interstate conflict because uh, yeah as I said these weapon systems could be used in different uh, in different contexts and um, personally my, my my personal research focuses on the case of Russia and um, it's obviously um, it's been uh, targeted as one of those countries that is completely against any kind of new regulation on autonomous weapons and um, Perhaps, uh, I mean, previously they said also that they are against such a political declaration, but perhaps it could be, I mean, uh, something that they could accept. Um, in in my opinion, maybe I'm too, I'm too hopeful. So, what is what is blocking a ban? Um, so, yeah, as you yourself said, it's a lack of a common definition. But I would think that a step towards um, you know, strengthening human control would, would uh, kind of bypass this whole discussion on definitions because it's been going on for years and it's just going nowhere. Uh, so maybe leave aside the definition and not force them to agree on the common definition, but at least agree on uh, that we are all committed to have 
um, to have, uh, yeah, and then you, the question is what is human control as well? And this idea of meaningful human control that is also unclear, but uh, to have, you know, a, yeah, a certain level of human decision making behind, uh, behind those decisions uh, on uh, selecting uh, and attacking um, targets and um, and not just um, lethal attack. I think it's it's worth saying that um, it's not only about killing somebody; it's actually just using force. So that's why I keep mentioning control over the use of force. Um, yeah, I don't know if this this answered at all. I just like uh, saying my thoughts. Maybe Alexi has uh, some yeah, thoughts. Well. I'd like to add something because I think the the political declaration is an important one to raise, and it it, it provides a context for the more nuclear people in the in the room as well. The, I I view it as like the one on human control and the use of force is a means of beginning to have those building blocks of consensus that hopefully can then be built upon kind of akin in, in terms of the nuclear example or kind of parallel might be a declaration that you can't win a nuclear war like the the parallel there is that in in the case of at least autonomous weapon systems a, a similar declaration to say that humans should always there should always be like a certain amount of human control within the decision to use force that within the scenario of autonomy, I think would be, it's not ideal, it's not solving the problem overnight, but I don't think we can reasonably expect that to happen. But I think it would be a good a good means of building a foundation of consensus that hopefully could be built upon. And that does at least a, 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 a minor restraining force in the direction of development of some of these systems. I've kind of got one point I kind of want to answer from the question, because I think that our host is having technical difficulties. And I've got a question for Anna as well that I want to, to throw in. Um, there's the, a question regards to the, um, what's the, the opportunities and risks of automated def aerial defense systems? Um, it's a worthwhile question. Um, often landmines are used as an example of the most simplistic lethal autonomous weapon system, but it's worth upping the complexity tree a little bit. In terms of the opportunities, speed, reliability. Um, are the key things that are generally raised in terms of defensive autonomous systems is that they can react to incoming threats far faster than um, a human operator could do so. Um, if you take, for example, um, missile defense systems on modern um, naval deployments, particularly those protecting um, aircraft carriers, it's critically important that an incoming threat can be reacted to at speed, particularly as a lot of these threats are coming at such a pace that a human operator barely has time to identify it, let alone react. So the opportunity is, is there. On the flip side of that, there's also the risk that the increased speed of response means that the judgment, the human judgment calls about the wider context don't have time to be made. Couple that with the fact that although these systems are very good, they're not 100% reliable. They do make mistakes. So it's feasible to suggest that if we, have, if we place too much reliance on automated systems, designed to act faster, we not only restrict the times where we can double check they're working, but also the, the time where we can actually make human orientated judgment calls on the wider context. An example might be um, provocation in, in the South China Sea with a jet buzzing an aircraft carrier group. A human captain might realize in the wider political context, it's very unlikely for this to escalate to the point of an actual risk to their carrier group. An automated machine system, however, isn't able to quantify that or perhaps isn't coded to quantify that within its decision making process and therefore will simply react in a standard response which might be lethal and certainly might then lead to escalation so that's that's a point i'd raise the question i'd like to ask anna and you touched on this in your presentation is that this is one of those technology sections where states are not really the key developing actors they're the they're the receivers of this technology and the users of it but those developing are private companies that often operate across borders um, that have different interests other than what we would hope the kind of normative geostrategic stability that influences state decisions. How can we consider getting them to the table to the fact they actually have buy-in to the kinds of decisions that we're trying to make over what's the right course of action and the use of autonomy in defense? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, so you, <clears throat> so 
so yeah um, at the moment um that's one of the key challenges i would say i i don't think i have an answer to this but um because and and you've mentioned this before as well earlier today on the dual use um ai is yeah it's the <laughs> dual use technology so um that's uh, an argument uh, brought up by by those who are that are the states that are against regulation is that um, if we if for, with with this ban we can affect the, the peaceful uh, I mean development and research development on AI that's um, that is for peaceful applications or civil applications so. Um, but then again, we have some uh, actors from the private sector also um, highlighting uh, highlighting the, the risks, and uh, I think they they also face an ethical dilemma in in whether they want to in, in in doing research and development on technologies that are potentially used uh, used in in the military. So, but how to get them to the discussion table? Uh, I mean. Right now, even the, the discussion table, even between governments, is a bit uh, unclear. Um, but maybe further down in my research, I'll have the answer for this. Thanks, Anna. That's really helpful. I think Ludovica is taking over from David for the moderation, so I'll step back. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alexi. Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, jumping in and replace David for a minute. Um, so we do have. Uh, two questions in the chat box, uh, and we have uh, Richard that just raised his hand. So I'm gonna, um, yeah, please, Richard, go go on, and then we uh, I'll read the question uh, of Rebecca and uh, Awais. Um, or if you Awais want to jump in and uh, I mean, personally ask your question. I mean, whatever you want. But please, Richard, go, go on. Okay, and, and I apologize for not typing in a question. I, my, I'm running off my tablet for doing this. My camera's connected to the tablet and I can only connect one thing into the tablet. So I connected the keyboard. Um, I'm, I'm chair of the um, uh, Joseph Rocklet uh, Memorial Trust, which is essentially holds uh, uh, money for Pugwash. It, it holds Joe Rockblatt's part of the Nobel Peace Prize Fund. Um, I also sat on the, uh, for international Pugwash, on the uh, steering committee for the campaign to stop killer robots uh, while Pugwash was a member of that committee. And I just wanted to, to um, sort of highlight with Anna and to ask her, uh, her views on, um, one of the, the challenges I found within uh, a lot of the people active within the, the campaign was they'd come from the experience of things like landmines and cluster munitions, which most of the time are single use technologies. Uh, there aren't many other purposes for these things. Uh, uh, my experience is from the control of chemical and biological weapons. And it's, and it's worth remembering it took 25 years to get a chemical weapons convention after the, you know, for, since the majority of states had said they uh, wanted to ban them. And within the chemical and biological weapons field, almost everything has multiple uses. Uh, dual use is a slightly limited term. Uh, and I feel that um, a lot of what will happen with autonomous weapons is actually going to be much more drawn in the long term on the concepts that are used in control of chemical and biological weapons on a web of prevention. It's not simply about a uh, one legal prohibition. It's about a whole range of measures that relate to the science, the technology and the politics and developing a taboo. Um, and one of my frustrations is that so little uh, is drawn on uh, from uh, in people looking at autonomous weapons from the experience of chemical and biological weapons rather than the experience of things like landmines. And I wondered if you had a comment. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much. That's um, I, I've read those discussions as well. Um, I don't personally have uh, yeah, much knowledge on the, the chemical and and nuclear weapons discussions, but there there's been a lot of comparisons uh, in academic literature, and I just uh, I would like to also again quote uh, Stuart Russell on this, and that's that 
if we manage to achieve bans in other uh, dual use technologies, then what's preventing us from doing the same with with autonomous weapons? Um, it's some some of these things are it's maybe might not be considered a preventive ban anymore uh, because uh, they have. There, there are reports that some technologies have the option of uh, operating um, and the selecting targets autonomously. So uh, it's, as I said, um, framing it as a future kind of killer robot issue is maybe not the most helpful way because you should uh, look at what the developments that are already ongoing and, um, and that might be a better incentive to to push for a, uh, for some sort of regulation. Um, but that's yeah, that's only my personal observations um, at the moment. And uh, after having attended the sessions last year, I would I would kind of add to that. I I would I think that there's a lot of parallels to be seen in the the norm and GG around cyber norms from into the, the open-ended uh, the GG around these autonomous weapon systems. And I think Anna's right that both of these, what they have in common, it's not preventative. Uh, it, it might have been framed that way, but in reality, these technologies aren't sci-fi and haven't been for a very long time. And we're increasingly seeing them being used. And potentially the, the difference here is that they've never been used at a scale to, to, to create that taboo or even the beginnings of that taboo. And until they do, there's, there's, I don't think there's enough incentive to actually try and drag them back. Once the, to use an overused metaphor, once Pandora's box is open, it's very attractive to some what they find within. And that's essentially what's happened. If you look at a really modern example of quite a high tech use of what is effectively a lethal times weapon system, the nagorno Kabakh use of lingering munitions and loitering munitions. That's a very advanced use of a, a system which is capable of making autonomous lethal decisions and then operating on them. Um, it's going to be very hard to put that back in the box and say, actually, after the fact, we decided we don't like these, you can't use them anymore. They've been sold around the world by multiple state actors and multiple different private sector companies. I think we need to recognize it's not sci-fi and actually these technologies are already not just in circulation, but in use. We just haven't had a large enough conflict to see them used at scale to generate that taboo. Uh, and policymakers are also, well, since you mentioned nagorno karabakh and uh, um, in Russia, policymakers, military policymakers are openly saying that this, oh, this look at this example of a way of, efficient way of conducting warfare and, uh, the benefits of autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. There are discourses that that reinforce these narratives, and and there's there needs to be something to counter those discourses uh, at the international level. Um, so we do have five minutes left, and, and um, I think I will read the three questions that we have so that we can get the final comments from every one of you. So Rebecca is asking um, what your thoughts were on how viable legal regulation uh, slash ban uh, is when it comes to laws to, to attribution, the problem of enforcement, for example, against a machine when a human is out of the loop. And then on WISE, uh, it would like to reflect on the de development of lethal autonomous weapons systems with regards to the ongoing revolution in military affairs and contemplate on the fundamentals of this new RMA, identify which tech areas needs to be regulated at the moment to preempt the security dilemma and point out uh, areas where academic researchers should focus more. This is a long one. And uh, <laughs> Niels, asks, uh, could better enforcement of accountability for violations of international humanitarian law serve as a substitute for a legal ban on laws? I'd, I'd kind of give a first start 
stab at the the human in the loop and attribution component i think it's, it's not necessarily attribution so attribution in this case we know we will it's relative it's a lot easier to know the, the system that has carried out an, a use of force and who deployed it the question will be who where's the responsibility sit for it if it does go wrong so if we take a lot of state positions that have contributed to the GG that state that current IHL is, is satisfactory. If that, if we were to take that as the case, if these systems were then to breach that by accident or mistaken use or by design, the question then is who is responsible? And that I, I think we've not quite answered yet. Is it the military commander that decided to deploy them into that particular um, combat or operational scenario where they perhaps were unsuited and therefore generated risk to civilians? Or is it because they were not properly designed to the point that they were capable of making decisions to a point that they are capable of satisfying the needs of IHL? So there's, there's, there are questions about where responsibility lies, depending on what level of autonomy along that spectrum that Anna mentioned exists, and who is responsible for them in the situation they were deployed. And that is assuming, obviously, we go with the, the current status quo of IHL as it stands is suitable to govern the use of lethal autonomous weapon systems. It gets more complicated to predict depending on should we have the ideal scenario where actually we, we see a political statement or actually a, a legal framework of restrictions. And yeah, um, I'll hand over to Anna or anyone else to try and have a stab at one of the others or add to that one. Yeah, um, maybe I could just contact the authors uh, later on to, to continue the discussion, but maybe on the on this last one on enforcement of accountability. Um, well, yeah, I, I'm not an international lawyer, but um, um, hearing other international lawyers speaking about this, I think there there's a, a lot of gaps in current in current IHL that would uh, yeah that actually create these problems of responsibility that Alex, Alexi just mentioned. So um, there's, I, I haven't heard of any um, ways of enforcing um, accountability and then with the current IHL, um, but it's a good, um, it's a good point and, and perhaps, yeah, question to, to reflect upon. And uh, thank you very much for all the questions. I will, I will try to contact the authors um, by email. <laughs> if I could answer one thing as well um, for that three listed question. Um, with the identifying tech areas, I think it's not just about tech areas as well. Um, so universities are also actually quite key actors too. Um, and there is a report, I cannot quite remember which NGO it's from, but they basically detail the sort of different universities in the UK, which are working on um, so you could say technologies that they see as potentially contributing to these autonomous weapons. So I want to point out it's not just um, about regulating tech areas too, there are actual academic actors, um, or I could say not academic, but there are actually universities um, that go into that. With the revolution in military affairs, I mean that's interesting. I think uh, I personally haven't I, I personally am not quite sure there's a revolution in military affairs yet, but other people may view differently. I think there's sort of two different schools of thoughts with revolution military affairs. You have those who are much more, um, I guess, like cautious with saying there's a revolution military affairs and see only very kind of few um, RMAs in actuality. And then you see other people who see AI as the revolution of military affairs. Um, but it's still important to consider that, uh, I mean, I think this is what everyone else always says is that AI is still, it's still narrow AI, it's not, to the point of just like general intelligence, but I also don't want to. Um, I, I also don't want to say that you know AI isn't going to be something more because I think it's important to uh, it's important to keep in mind the theoretical possibilities of things. In my opinion, because humans just have so many cognitive biases and flaws that there are things that we may not potentially even think about. Um, that I still think that there is actually a place for science fiction, basically. Um, and that they, there are components of reality or it's the reality itself. And there was a third point, I think, with this one, which is areas where academic researchers should focus more. I haven't really thought about um, that kind of question, to be honest. I think something that would be interesting 
Um, it is really just all about looking at states kind of cost benefit or ways they that they think about lethal autonomous weapons would be very, very interesting. And how they actually weigh out the kind of the costs of such things, because I have seen very different opinions. So, for instance, obviously, Stuart Russell is is a key figure um, in talking about the more sort of um, the potentiality of the sort of more general artificial intelligence um, and how, you know, we shouldn't just um, dismiss these kind of big potentialities because it sounds like science fiction to us. Um, and it would just be interesting to see to see how states and obviously you have to define who you're actually interviewing as well. That's the other thing. Think about lethal autonomous weapons um, because, as I again said, there's contrasting opinions. It seems like even within the more kind of um, scientific community. But honestly, from the scientists I have spoken to, um, a lot of them seem to actually be much more open to the kind of theoretical possibilities than the actual um, policy decision makers. But someone else might have a different experience there. Excellent presentation. Uh, I, I think the final thing I'd like to add in terms of what researchers could do next is, is we, we need to expand our range of thinking and our perspectives in this space. Um, and I, I think that we these events are a, a starting point in doing that. But an earlier question touched upon the fact that actually there's a vast array of, of third countries that don't yet have this technology or have some bits of it they've bought, some bits that they developed. They are going to be playing a huge role in the direction that practice and doctrine develops over the next five to 10 years, not 20 or 30, five to 10 years in this space. And I think that we need to be listening to them now and engaging them now to work out what that direction might be and how we actually need to build that into the processes that we're trying to put together to ensure that what where we are in five or ten years is where we want to be and not where we hope we're not. All right, thank you everyone uh, for your great presentations and for a challenging discussion. Um, thank you, Alexi. Thank you, Orlando and Anna. I will now uh, close the session and as you can read in the chat um, to join the other workshops of today, you can either stay within the Zoom meeting or use the joining link sent to you on, on the registration. Uh, we will um, have the second session at 1.30. Uh, it's a workshop on UK nuclear weapons politics and we will have Tim Shreed, Geoffrey Chapman and Hamley Fogg. And I will, I will leave you to your Saturday lunch. Uh, thank you very much to everyone and see you in a bit.